Uh, hello, I'm Jason Holland. I'm going to be presenting this uh, with Joel Snyder, as Howard mentioned. Uh, we're both from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, um, and we're super excited to tell you about some uh, pilot results uh, that we came up with looking at the effect of meditation on wisdom, as well as psychological well-being uh, and cognitive function among uh, late middle age and older adults. And we view this as a, a, a very uh, important, very interesting question, uh, primarily because this is a question that's been tossed around for thousands of years. Uh, and so even uh, the Buddha himself is quoted as saying, meditation brings wisdom, and a lack of meditation leaves ignorance. Um, and even all the way up to the present day, uh, if you look at popular books about meditation, uh, if you uh, listen to meditation experts speak, uh, they're using these two words in the same breath. They're talking about wisdom and talking about meditation at the same time. And so it seems reasonable to think that there may be some link there, but to our knowledge, nobody has really put this to the test. No one has really looked at this empirically. And we really view that as kind of the major innovation of the study that we conducted, is that to our knowledge, this really is the first experimental test uh, of this research question of does meditation actually lead to greater wisdom. Uh, there are a couple other unique aspects of this study that are worth mentioning. One is that we used an active control condition, so we're comparing meditation to a general relaxation group, uh, which is somewhat rare in the literature. We're also focusing on older individuals, which I think also adds some interest to this study. Uh, you know, uh, many theorists have argued that uh, this is a kind of a, a critical period uh, in terms of uh, kind of uh, developing wisdom. Uh, in addition, older adults are certainly a fast-growing population. They're an underserved population. So we felt as though if we could develop some kind of a, a program that would be easily implemented and disseminated uh, that could lead in broad uh, improvements uh, for these individuals, there would be great value in that. Um, and so in terms of our, our present aims and hypotheses here, essentially we're comparing uh, meditation training to general relaxation training. And we hypothesize that there would be uh, a, an advantage for the meditation group uh, in terms of enhancing wisdom, in terms of improving psychological well-being, and also in terms of improving uh, sensory and cognitive function among these uh, individuals. Uh, this is a small uh, study, uh, and so we were only able to uh, recruit 19 participants in sort of the time frame that we had. 11 were assigned to meditation, 8 were assigned to general relaxation. We did use random assignment, and that's sort of the way that it, it shook out. Uh, average age was around 66 years old. Uh, there was uh, some tendency for the, the sample to be kind of primarily women, uh, primarily Caucasian individuals, and highly educated individuals. And so there's some bias in our sample, which certainly is, is a limitation of the study. Uh, in terms of our procedures, we randomly assigned folks to groups. Uh, assessments were conducted uh, before the training and then within a week after the training. Uh, and uh, both the meditation and general relaxation groups consisted of five uh, daily 90-minute sessions. So it was almost like a, a mini retreat or something like that. In terms of uh, what these groups uh, actually consisted of, um, uh, first of all, I should mention that, uh, that, that uh, Mark Allen, uh, who worked with us very closely on this project and is actually uh, watching right now online. Hi, Mark. Uh, hope you're having a great Friday. Uh, he was really the, the sort of one who really developed uh, these interventions and was also the instructor uh, who was teaching these groups. Uh, suffice it to say that, that people were engaged in a variety of different exercises in both groups, but the primary distinction really was that in the meditation group, uh, uh, participants were uh, given instruction, given training, uh, given advice on really focusing non-judgmentally on the present moment. And then when they would find that they would sort of lose track of that and uh, you know, maybe get distracted by a thought or get distracted by a feeling, they were given the instruction to just simply notice that and then gently bring themselves back to the present moment and to keep doing that. And so in the meditation group, that was emphasized a lot. It was emphasized every session constantly. Uh, and then in the relaxation group, uh, we tried as best as possible to not to give that instruction. And that really was the primary distinction between these two groups. 
In terms of our uh, measures that we were using, uh, we were using Monica's uh, three-dimensional wisdom scale, uh, and you made my talk really easy. I, I won't go into a lot of uh, detail about that scale because she did such a beautiful job of describing it, uh, but we were looking at all three domains of the three-dimensional wisdom scale, and that is a self-report measure. In terms of psychological well-being, we were looking at a measure of depression, a measure of generalized anxiety, and a measure of perceived stress. And then in terms of executive function, we were using the Wisconsin card sorting task, a computerized version, and we were looking at a number of different kind of ways of scoring that. Uh, and then Joel's going to be talking uh, 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 primarily about uh, some of the uh, auditory uh, functioning measures that we used. And so we had a speech and noise task where uh, participants uh, had to uh, recognize uh, the speech of a woman like in sort of a crowded party kind of type of situation. Uh, and then we also did some kind of ERP assessments, which Joel is going to be talking about in depth. Uh, so in terms of our plan of analysis, I'll just go through this very briefly. Uh, our sample size was so small, we felt as though it probably didn't make a lot of sense to really focus on tests of statistical significance. So we're primarily focusing here on effect sizes, uh, specifically adjusted effect sizes that adjust for any potential baseline differences. Um, Joel is also going to be talking about some uh, other analyses that we ran. We ran some kind of two-by-two two repeated measures, ANOVAs, uh, as well as some simple correlations. Probably won't be able to talk about all those findings, but uh, certainly there's some very interesting stuff in there that Joel will be uh, talking about. So let's get right to the results. Uh, in terms of wisdom, uh, you know, essentially what we found is that it's pretty hard to make somebody wise in five days. Uh, <laughs> And so uh, we don't see whopping effects here, uh, at least in the immediate aftermath of these groups, and at least on this particular uh, measure of wisdom. Now, we, we do see some effects when we start looking at psychological well-being, particularly for generalized anxiety and perceived stress. We actually see kind of medium effect sizes there. The effect size for depression is pretty small, but when we looked at that a little bit closer, it looked more like uh, both groups were actually becoming less depressed over time, and it wasn't so much that uh, we weren't seeing any change in those domains. It was just that the effects got washed out because both groups improved. Um, and then actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, hand it over to Joel here. He's kind of the uh, cognitive psychology expert on the project, and so he's going to be able to talk about this in uh, much greater uh, detail than I will be able to. So. All right. Thanks, Joel. Jason. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so for uh, executive function, again, this is the Wisconsin card sorting task. And to make a long story short, we, we found some pretty impressive changes. Uh, the relaxation group, just since we don't have the graph, uh, didn't change very much after the uh, intervention, but the meditation group did change quite a bit on a number of different ways of scoring the, the Wisconsin card sorting task. And you know, some of these effect sizes are, are pretty good size. If you actually look at the interaction plots, they're, they're pretty impressive, even though we don't have a chance to, to show them right now. Um, the, the sensory measures are a little bit what Jason was talking about in terms of there are some changes in both of the groups. These effect sizes, which really reflect the interaction between the group and the pre to post testing. You know, they're not very large. And in this case, the relaxation group is actually showing a bigger improvement in understanding speech and noise. Um, and so this is actually the interaction plot showing there. So both groups are, are showing a, a pretty good improvement in, in this uh, speech and noise task, which again is just a, a common measure of uh, how you can understand a sentence in a noisy background when other people are talking. And importantly, this is something that older adults have a lot of problems with subjectively and objectively. It's kind of a big deal type of task that a lot of people around the world study. So it's uh, potentially encouraging. Although one thing we don't know, we have to be cautious, it's possible that actually practicing the task results in improvement. So in the future, we may need some additional control groups that don't get any contact with, uh, with Mark Allen or someone like that. Uh, the last thing is the auditory function. This is maybe you know, a similar type of thing. If you look at this P1 response, it's actually getting bigger in both groups from pre to post. Again, we don't know if it's because of exposure to the speech and noise task or because of exposure to these tones. But basically, these individuals were just listening to tones while watching a movie, so they weren't doing any type of task. So it's a bit surprising to see this kind of improvement with, uh, you know, if it's just due to the auditory exposure. So maybe this is actually an effect of the, the meditation. And, and the meditation effect is slightly larger, as you saw from the interaction effect sizes before. Um, the last uh, result I want to show you is some of these correlations. And I'm just going to focus on a couple, because it, it leads to some future directions. So 
uh, what we found is that the cognitive aspect of wisdom is highly correlated with the measures of executive function at baseline and, and also at the post-test. So it's a similar, pretty robust effect. And we find this pretty interesting, uh, especially since you know, there was an improvement in wisdom, but there was improvement in this executive function task, which is highly correlated with wisdom. It suggests that further down the line, if there's more extended uh, you know, training on meditation, there, there could be some benefits for wisdom as well. And so that's something we're really interested in, in future directions. Um, I won't go through this whole summary since we're kind of out of time, but I did want to focus more on the future directions. So we, we're interested in continuing this work, uh, certainly with larger sample sizes, more extended meditation training, uh, additional control groups, as I just mentioned, may be important to have a, a no contact control group of, of some sort where they don't get any kind of training. Um, and perhaps additional measures of wisdom would, would show slightly different or converging evidence in terms of the, the findings we're getting. Um, we're also interested in doing uh, assessment in the longer term, so even after the, the training stops, as I think Jason mentioned, this could be valuable. Maybe some of the, the, the wisdom benefits could arise over a longer period of time, even after training stops. Um, and finally, you know, as Jason mentioned, we're really excited to work with Mark Allen and he is as well in developing some tools that you know, we can use and also the, the general scientific community can use to do uh, meditation research because it, it seems like it could have some pretty big benefits. So thank you. Uh, these are our volunteers. And I, I did want to mention just one thing. I would uh, like to specifically uh, thank Howard and Brenda for making this possible and, and also our, our labs uh, did a tremendous amount of work in a very short amount of time, and this is a pretty heroic effort on their part. So, it's pretty unprecedented, I think, probably for both of us. <laughs> Meditation is an umbrella term yeah. that covers many, many different practices. Umbrella term that covers many, many different practices. Sure. And I wondered if you could say a little bit about the content of the meditative regimen that you put these elderly folk through. I can speak I think, to that. I think Jason um, Yeah, yes. certainly. So, uh, you know, I think probably initially the group would start out with kind of some psychoeducation about mindfulness and meditation. And I know then Mark started first with kind of a very basic meditation. And so people were just focusing on the breath and they were directed to kind of pay attention to that. And then if they got distracted to just gently bring themselves back to the breath. And then there was kind of this progressive kind of uh, movement toward uh, being mindful in more real life contexts. And so for example, Mark would have them meditate with their eyes open. And so they're actually focusing on some kind of external stimuli while they're meditating. Then he had them doing walking meditations. And so they were actually walking around campus and doing things like appreciating nature uh, while meditating, things of that sort. Uh, we also, I know he also gave them some instruction uh, about continuing the practice, um, and so I think that's part of the reason too why we're really encouraged to look at uh, some of the follow-up data for this. Hi, I wondered if you could go back to the slide that shows the results for the wisdom scales. Yeah, that one. Um, it actually, we have some research on meditation and uh, the same scales. Um, and I wonder, with the affective domain, um, this goes back to the question that was just asked, if I wouldn't expect the affective domain to change given a, like a mindfulness for breathing meditation, and I wonder if you've considered doing something like what Tanya Singer's done and done like a compassion training or compassion meditation training, because that seems like it would directly tap this third dimension, which in this case is moving uh, sort of in the opposite direction of what I imagine you'd hope for. I, I have some ideas about that. So yeah, I think that's a great, a great question. And, uh, certainly, we were uh, a bit perplexed to see that as well. I mean, the average comes out to about zero when you average across the scales. But yeah, if you look at those individual ones, it's kind of perplexing. Why would we see some slight advantage uh, for the relaxation group? Uh, I have a, a hypothesis about that, um, and it's sort of uh, unique and particular to our study uh, in that, uh, I guess, and this is one of the limitations of doing these things in groups. Uh, and so we had two meditation groups and we had two relaxation groups. One of the relaxation groups uh, had like five people and the other had like three. 
Uh, and what we found was that in one of the groups there was a, a participant uh, who a lot of people had difficulties with. Uh, and so this person was coughing, this person had uh, some physical ailments that made it very difficult to sit still. Uh, I was fielding multiple complaints uh, about this participant and I spoke uh, at great length with Mark about this and we decided that really in many ways this could enhance the relaxation group uh, because it's a more real world kind of condition. You know, when you're trying to relax in the real world, it'd be great if you could go to a spa and do that, but you're probably in your office, uh, you're probably in your car, you're probably somewhere uh, that is not necessarily conducive to relaxation. And so we talked a lot about really using that as a tool to help people really deepen their relaxation. And I think as a result, people may have actually uh, ended up uh, gaining a lot of greater empathy for this person. So rather than getting complaints about this person afterwards, this person had really, even in five days, kind of become an integral member of the group. And uh, my hypothesis would be that's part of the reason why we're seeing uh, maybe some uh, improvements in this affective domain uh, for people in the relaxation condition, because so much of, of those questions seem to tap into things like empathy and compassion and things like that. So. I also imagine it could be the case that, now you have a small sample, so it's hard to say definitively, but it could be that just learning the mindfulness meditation without the compassion component allows people to put up a wall between them and mm. their feelings for others. Actually, yeah. So <laughs> I can speak to that as well. So obviously there's a lot of, of different findings here that we could talk about. Uh, and we, we, we did look at other outcomes, one of those being emotion regulation. Um, and one thing that we did find was those in the meditation group uh, tended to Im report improvements or greater improvements compared to the relaxation condition on the ability to suppress their emotions. Um, and so when they needed to, uh, they reported that they could uh, decrease uh, negative uh, emotion or even sort of increase positive emotion or decrease positive emotion as they needed to. That would seem to kind of speak to what you're talking about, uh, is that in some ways that they were better able to almost sort of put up some kind of a wall or something like that. Um, interestingly, when we looked at sort of mindfulness measures, uh, we did find some advantage for the meditation group, but uh, the effects were not as whopping as you might think they were, um, suggesting that maybe the mechanisms of change that are involved are, are not necessarily what we might think they would be. Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering too, guys, if did the participants have any sense that meditation training or relaxation training could be useful or beneficial to them? Um, and if that, if you had some measure of that, did that relate to any of the gains that people got from the intervention? I don't think we measured that. I, I tested some of the participants at post-test and they were, I mean, they, they were generally positive about the experiences they had. And I, I imagine they had some idea that this is possibly beneficial Probably that's the reason they enrolled in the study. We but, did have one yeah. question at the beginning about would you prefer to, to be in uh, meditation okay. or would you prefer to be in relaxation? And we did find there was some advantage for the meditation group uh, that, that uh, uh, it wasn't uh, like everyone preferred that. Uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I want to say it was something like maybe uh, 60 to 70 percent preferred meditation, and then there was maybe 40 to 30 percent uh, that uh, preferred relaxation or kind of didn't have a strong preference. Uh, certainly, I would imagine that could also influence the results. We tried very hard to be as neutral as we possibly could about the two groups and make them both seem very credible uh, to the participants, but I think that. Uh, you can never do that perfectly sort of thing. Yeah. So certainly I think that's a limitation. Yeah, but even with the relaxation group, I mean, just interacting with Mark for that extended period of time, I mean, he's a very neat guy. So I'm sure just, I mean, I've had lunch with him and that's a great experience as well. <laughs> Maybe I would benefit from that. I don't know. You need so. a Mark control. Yeah, yeah. They can talk to me instead of Mark. <laughs> I was wondering, actually following up a little bit, um, how the soliciting was framed. So what did you tell people to recruit? So what was the framework for the study? Did you say, oh, we'd like you to participate in a study to learn about meditation? Or what, could you just quickly tell me? We, we phrased it as a, a, a study looking at the effect of meditation and relaxation. Um, and so kind of trying to really balance those two. And nothing else, not, not any talk about outcomes. 
uh, we with regard to about, what? Uh, that we were interested in looking at wisdom, we were interested in okay. looking at well-being, and we okay. were interested in looking at... Okay, uh, uh, all right. Okay, so, yeah. There's a little bit of a problem in there. I think whenever you start using the term wisdom in soliciting participants, you're creating a framework for the study and you use as a dependent measure, a self-report measure of wisdom. So that creates all sorts of conundrums, I would say. But I don't want to go into detail. We can talk in the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I, I mean, I think that uh, I'd be very interested to hear creative ways of dealing with that. There are sort of IRB issues associated with that where uh, you know, they want us to be as sort of straightforward and sort of honest about the intention of, of the Oh, yeah, you can still possible. be honest without yeah. using that term. Right, but right. I can talk to you about that. Sure. Um, I thought it was very exciting that you had some objective outcome measures, in particular on the cognitive performance side yeah. mm -hmm. and sensory functioning. I really think this is important and crucial. Uh, I would like to encourage you to complement this with objective measures on the emotion regulation side, mm -hmm. because there is lots of evidence from earlier work on meditation, which uses a different dosage of meditation. You mm. may be familiar with the early work by Wolf Singer and, and the uh, Buddhist monk, where they really studied extreme cases of intensity of meditation. And what you find there, the brain effects are just mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. So what it really does is it increases the default network in the brain, which basically, I mean, in lay language, may mean that by intensive exposure to this meditative state, you encourage your brain to be more circumspect, more oriented towards everything that might happen around you, to take the brain basically out of its rut. And this is what life otherwise is all about. It's about getting into ruts. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I think, and, and that will not only concern judgment and reasoning, it will definitely concern emotional evaluations yeah. and reactions. Yeah, and we, we have some evidence that we didn't have a chance to talk to in terms of uh, motion regulation. It, it's a self-report measure, but um, we do have some hints at that as well. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, no, no, there's no main effect or interactions. Uh, the effect sizes are pretty small for both the main effect and the interaction. Yeah. So there's no hint at that just yet, but uh, there's reason to believe because of the links between wisdom and executive function that there could be something down the road. Yeah. Um. Matika Kanwar from the webcast would like to know um, for how long your effects of enhanced cognitive function and mindfulness carry over into their daily lives, and uh, what differences did they report in life thereafter? In, in the, what was the last thing you said? Uh, what differences did they report in life thereafter? So did they report oh. feeling better after um, the five days of meditation training? Uh, you mean at sort of a follow-up? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we we're planning on doing some follow-up with these, you know, whichever individuals are willing to respond to our inquiries. Uh, but we don't have that information yet because we just finished the study. <laughs> but yeah, that's, and, and certainly with larger sample size, that would be probably more feasible and informative. But yeah, that's an important issue for sure. <laughs> 